So hello. Um, let me see, I haven't used this clicker before. Uh, so who am I? I'm Shelley, I am a cat lady. I used to be a kindergarten teacher and I started working in technology in the last year and a half or thereabouts. Uh, my hobbies include moving to different countries and baking cakes for people. Um, so at the moment I live in Amsterdam, uh, but in a couple of weeks, possibly Germany. Um, so what am I here for? I want to sell you all on a controversial idea. Uh, controversial because a lot of people look at me the face like, why would I do that? Um, I want you all to treat yourself with kindness, uh, patience and respect. So I want you to treat yourself like you'd treat a really good friend. Um, so I used to be a kindergarten teacher. Something I found surprising is how young the external pressures start. So those pressures that, uh, that build up to convince us that we're not enough, that will probably fail before we even start. Um, it always broke my heart when a four-year-old would come to me and they would refuse to even try to do something because they already thought, no, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, so I found that through treating, through treating the children with kindness and with patience and gentle encouragement, I could help them towards trying something and discovering that, OMG, they can do it. And it's, it's always super satisfying to see the look in the kid's face to, when they realize, okay, no, if I try, I can do this. So I, I taught in a bilingual kindergarten and I was the English teacher and there was also a German teacher. And there was one child who, he just wouldn't speak at all to me. Uh, he was just super nervous about the level of his English. So I wouldn't force the subject, I would let him just communicate however he wanted to. Some days he would just point at things and some days he would try one or two words. And one day I sat at a table with him and some other kids and I was speaking to one of them and he turned to me and he said, hey Shelley, I'm here too. I was like, you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> I spoke to him and he started speaking to me in full sentences out of nowhere. Told me about his weekend with his grandma and they were playing with, car, uh, with his cars. And uh, so it took a long time to get to the point, like to encourage him to have the confidence to speak. But it was super satisfying to get there and it was, it was just wonderful to see. And he basically didn't stop talking after that. <laughs> Um, so I was patient with the children. I was always kind and would encourage them and everything, but not with myself. Um, so that internal mean voice that so many people have, I, I say so many people, I haven't met very many people at all who say, I don't know what that is, I, I've never been mean to myself in my head. Um, it's exhausting, it's always there, ready to tear you apart when you try something. As soon as you falter along the way, it's a, oh yeah, I told you so, I knew you wouldn't be able to do that, you idiot. And um, so I realized one day that it was, it was kind of hypocritical of me. Uh, so I decided to stop, which is where patience comes in. So that inner voice is, um, it's poised, it's ready to go, it's always there, it's a reflex, and it takes some time to get rid of it. What I found useful for me, but I know probably doesn't work for everyone, was that I just stopped myself. I started to actively listen to myself, and instead of something like, oh great, you spilled a cup of water everywhere, you idiot, I would just stop myself, actually say, shh, in my head, restart the sentence, I spilled water, I'm gonna clean it up and get some more water. And that was it. Um, if I wouldn't speak to a child or to a close friend that way, I wouldn't speak to myself that way. I would refuse to speak to myself that way, rather. But it's really important at this stage to be super patient with yourself because it's, it's very, very hard to unlearn something that you have done for years. Uh, one of the most unexpected side effects from this was how much time I saved when I didn't sit around calling myself names for <laughs> 10 minutes after doing something. So um, this brings me around to, to, to burnout. So some of you might be familiar with burnout, whether through reading about it or experiencing it yourself. I was at a conference in May and one of the sessions at this well, on conference was about burnout. And of all of the sessions over that whole weekend, it was the most populated one. And uh, the session leader of this particular one spoke about the 12 stages of burnout. So I'm just going to read them out here. Um, one of the first stages is the compulsion to prove yourself. So demonstrating your own worth obsessively, it tends to hit the best employees, those with enthusiasm who ex accept responsibility readily. Um, working harder, you get an, a, an inability to switch off. Neglecting your needs. Um, so like erratic sleeping, your eating is disrupted, you don't go interacting socially quite as much. You just put yourself last. 
uh, displacement of conflicts. Problems are dismissed. We might feel threatened, panicky, and jittery. So if something is going wrong, it's you tend to push it externally. It's it's other people's fault, and you don't really uh, consider maybe I'm not okay. Uh, revision of your values. Your values are skewed, your friends and family are dismissed, your hobbies are seen as irrelevant, and work is your only focus. So this, this is mostly specific to work-related burnout, but this can happen in pretty much any uh, department of your life. Um, denial of emerging problems. So an intolerance, perceiving collaborators as stupid, lazy, demanding, or undisciplined. Uh, it's, it, social context, it's, it's harder for you to uh, interact necessarily. Um, cynicism, aggression, problems are viewed as caused by time pressure and work, not because of your life changes. Withdrawal, so you withdraw from your friends, from your family, from like your social situations, because uh, you're just that stressed out basically. Um, changes in your behavior are obvious to your, friend and your friends and your family, so they might show concern. And you're at a stage where you kind of would ignore this. You'd say, no, I'm just, I'm working hard. Uh, depersonalization. So you don't see yourself, you don't see other people as valuable, and you no longer really perceive your own needs. Uh, inner emptiness. Uh, feeling empty inside, and to overcome this, you look for activities such as overeating, or alcohol, or drugs, or your activities are often exaggerated. Um, depression, feeling this is where my, my slide doesn't really fit. <laughs> Feeling lost and unsure, exhausted, your future feels bleak and dark, and then full-on burnout syndrome is um, just total collapse, essentially. For me, like it, I would just I would get very sick uh, physically and really would just have to stop everything and just shut down for a bit. Um, when he read those, he asked if anybody there saw themselves in any of what was listed, and every, all but one person put their hand up and recognized something. So you might not go through every single uh, point on the list. You might go in a different order, but um, everybody in that room, bar one, had experienced this. Um, so people, for the most part, heard descriptions of their own behavior and their own experience. And that's hard to hear. It's hard to address these things. Um, there's a saying that you should be kind to people because you don't know what battles they're fighting. But if we open up about our battles and if we speak more openly with each other about what we're going through, it can help other people to understand us and it can help us all realize that we're not as alone as it can sometimes feel. 25 to 50% of people will have experience of mental illness at some point in their life. So it's, it's something that touches quite a lot of us and the more open we are, the more normalized it is and the easier it is to talk about. So I said earlier to shush your negative thoughts, but I'm not saying uh, you should always stop yourself when negative thoughts creep in though. If you're having a hard time with something, um, don't ignore the associated feelings, but instead speak them aloud. Uh, so like, it's hard being alone on the weekend, and you know, I wanted to do stuff with people, or it's, it's tough to work really hard and for people not to recognize what I'm doing. If you uh, make eye contact with the problems that you're facing, it becomes easier to deal with them. Because uh, if you just completely ignore what's going on, it'll all crowd up and it'll all overwhelm you at some point. So it's important uh, to make an effort to actively listen to yourself, to recognize the signs from your body or your mind that you're spreading yourself too thin. Something I've noticed that when I'm under a lot of stress and not taking care of myself properly, I have tinnitus, I've had it for a few years, and the more stressed I am, the louder it gets. And uh, I also get really bad earaches and stuff. Like it, it manifests physically for me if I'm super stressed. Um, so we talk a lot about self-care and about how important it is, but it, always remember like one self-care method for one person might not work as well for everybody. So it's good to try out different things and see what works for you. Uh, okay, I don't know what happened there. Um, so the basics, there's a self-care flowchart online. Uh, it, it has a really long link, so there was no point in putting it on a slide, so I'll tweet it out later. I'm at Shelly Cohn. It helps you with the basics. So it's, you know, it starts off with, okay, have you slept enough? Uh, go take a nap, come back and finish this off. Have you drank enough water? Have you eaten? And it just checks out all of yeah, the basic things 
uh, to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Um, build a support network. This isn't always easy. Um, I have a really solid support network and I'm really lucky with this. I know it's not always the case for people. Um, so yeah, try to find your people, whether in physical spaces or online, by say going to meetups or joining different communities online. Um, I'm reluctant to say real life versus online because some of my best friends are far away in like Ireland or in America and our interactions are mainly online but no less real. Um, what do you love to do? What helps you to relax and unwind? If you find the activity that helps you, whether it's sewing or baking or reading or writing or climbing up onto big wooden elks outside of Ikea while lots of people give you funny looks, find it and do it. <laughs> um, it was around closing time, there were so many people walking past us and I just gave it socks. I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm going to have fun with this. Um, so writing. Uh, morning pages, uh, it's a concept from a book I read before. And it's in the morning, you just write three pages. Just fill three pages with anything. Uh, it's three pages of longhand stream of consciousness, consciousness writing done first thing in the morning. There's no wrong way to do morning pages. It's not high art. It's not even writing. They're about anything and everything that crosses your mind. They're for your eyes only. Um, it provokes, morning pages provoke, clarify, comfort, cajole, prioritize and synchronize the day at hand. Don't overthink morning pages, just put three pages of anything on the page and then do three more pages tomorrow. So what I found with that was, um, it kind of gets all of those niggly thoughts out of your head. You just write it down and it's, it's gone, it's kind of dealt with. And um, even if you're sitting there and you don't know what to write, you just write, I don't know what to write over and over until something kind of clicks in. Um, so I've written up here a done list, and I know at times when, uh, if you're going through a rough time and you have a huge to-do list, and you know, you're going to bed and you're like, oh, there's still so many things on my to-do list, it's quite stressful. And what I find helps is, uh, so a friend of mine calls this having zero, like non-zero days. So uh, you just write down the little things that you've done and at the end of the day, you do have a list of, now you know what, I feel like I didn't do too much, but I did actually accomplish getting out of bed or <laughs> reading my favorite book today. Um, and then an awesome notebook. It's pretty much how it sounds. You write down awesome things that have happened or things you've achieved. So it's important to recognize your own achievements um, or your three favorite things or reason to be cheerful from throughout the day. Um, this one, I'm, I'm bad at it because I forget about it. But every so often when I remember, I have it right in little things, and that's a nice one to look back on uh, later on. So there's mixed opinions on selfies. Some people hate them, but I really love this quote from Paul Fenwick. Um, I'll read it out. OK, folks, we need to have a chat about you all posting selfies, rambles about how much you love your friends, sweet pictures of you with your partners, pictures of your pets being adorable, endless shots of your children and what you had for lunch today. For crying out loud, please, please keep doing this. I love it. I really, really do. I love people who are excited about how they look, about how their dog is adorable, about how their family's the best, their friends the most fun, their trip the most exciting, and their food the most delicious. I love it when you're doing things which make you happy, and I love it when you share that with others. Um, if for some reason I don't like it, then that's my problem, not yours. I want you to flourish. I want you to be having the best time you possibly can. And if you share that with me, then I feel even more special for it. Thank you. And I, just, I, I love this sen sentiment because there's so many people who say, no, selfies are so, like, it's, it's so narcissistic, it's terrible, but I think, no, let's celebrate ourselves. Like, it's, it's good to celebrate yourself. Um, so I was at AlterCon from Portland last year, and one of the talks was called Broken Body Beautiful, How Taking Selfies with My iPhone Helped Me Find Self-Love. It's wonderful, and I'd encourage you to look up the video of it. I, I, I will share a link to it, actually, uh, later also. But uh, Kylie Smith, who gave the talk, she had a call for action. It was for everyone to take out their phones and take a selfie. You don't have to post it anywhere if you don't want to, but if you do, uh, put the AlterConf hashtag on it. But take out your phones. I forgot to bring mine with me <laughs> from my chair, but take out your phones and take a selfie and uh, post it if you want to, and you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, so a month and a half ago, Ash also did SelfieCon which I really liked. <laughs> yes. So I'm not going to uh, go around and demand that you all do this, but it's, it's lovely. Like, everybody at the, the one in Portland, or I mean, a lot of people uh, did.
take the picture and share it. It's kind of dark in here though, that's a bit tricky for taking them. Um, but smile, take a picture. <laughs> so I'm giving you all the minute to do so. <laughs> Sweaty selfie up here. Thank you. <laughs> I think my phone is somewhere in my bag. Okay, so for those of you who have done it, and even if you haven't, uh, just so look at the person in the picture, just look at yourself. I want you to show that person gentleness, patience, and kindness. You're worthy of love, you're worthy of kindness, and you're wonderful, and you deserve wonderful things. So thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, the super cute self-care tip pictures were by Gail Galligan, so she's Robochai on Twitter and Tumblr. Thanks, Igor, for taking all of those millions of pictures <laughs> on the elk. And uh, yes, thanks uh, to Kylie Smith for the idea that I hijacked for everyone to take a picture. So thank you. <laughs>